We continue reading from Bhagavad Gita as it is. We are at chapter 5, text 27 to 28. Sparshan Kritva Bahir Mahayamsh. Sparshan Kritva Bahir Mahayamsh. Chakshus Chayvantare Bhruvaho. Chakshus Chayvantare Bhruvaho. Prana Pana Samukritva Prana Pana Samukritva Nasa Bhyantara Charina Nasa Bhyantara Charina Yatendriya Manobuddha Yatendriya Manobuddha Munir Moksha Parayana Muni Moksha Parayana Vigate Chabhai Grodho Vigate Chabhai Grodho Yasada Mukta Evasa Yasada Mukta Evasa You'll read Yeah, I can. I'm on a mobile today, so I can try. I think it's visible. Oh. Okay. Okay, yeah. Hmm. So, translation shutting out all external sense objects, keeping the eyes and vision concentrated between the two eyebrows, suspending the inward and outward breaths within the nostrils, and thus controlling the mind, senses, and intelligence. The transcendentalist aiming at liberation becomes free from desire, fear, and anger. One who is always in this state is certainly liberated. Being engaged in Krishna consciousness, one can immediately understand one's spiritual identity. And then one can understand the Supreme Lord by means of devotional service. When one is well situated in devotional service, one comes to the transcendental position, qualified to feel the presence of the Lord in the sphere of one's activity. This particular position is called liberation in the Supreme. After explaining the above principles of liberation in the Supreme, the Lord gives instruction to Arjuna as to how one can come to that position by the practice of the mysticism or yoga known as Ashtanga Yoga which is divisible into an eightfold procedure called Yam, Niyam, Asan, Pranayam, Pratyara, Dharna, Dhyan, and Samadhi. In the sixth chapter, the subject of yoga is explicitly, is explicitly detailed and at the end of the fifth, it is only preliminary, preliminarily explained. One has to drive out the sense objects such as sound, touch, form, taste, and smell by the pratyadhar process in yoga. And then keep the vision of the eyes between the two eyebrows and concentrate on the tip of the nose with half-closed lids. There is no benefit in closing the eyes altogether because then there is every chance of falling asleep. Nor is there benefit in opening the eyes completely because then there is the hazard of being attracted by sense objects. The breathing movement is restrained with, within the nostrils by neutralizing the up moving and down moving air within the body. The practice of such yoga, one is able to gain control over the senses, refrain from outward sense objects and thus prepare oneself for liberation in the Supreme. This yoga process helps one become free from all kinds of fear and anger and thus feel the presence of the super soul in the transcendental situation. In other words, Krishna consciousness is the easiest process of executing yoga principles. This will be thoroughly explained in the next chapter. A Krishna conscious person, however, being always engaged in devotional service does not risk losing his senses to some other engagement. 
this is a better way of controlling the senses than by ashtang yoga so in the next chapter sixth chapter krishna speaks about this dhyan yoga you know the process of meditation and he's just giving a hint in this uh, verse about it keeping keeping the eyes closed no, well not closed half closed and controlling the mind and senses but what and what is the what's the 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 goal of this meditation is not to become some zero or something the yogi we hear in bhagavatam third canto kapila muni when he's teaching the process of yoga the yogi is always um concentrating his mind on the form of parmatma in the heart and the parmatma's form is the four armed vishnu form that is the goal of the yogi to realize the parmatma in the heart not some you know not just some imagination or some light or some nothing or no specifically to realize the parmatma the four armed vishnu form so shla prabhupa is pointing out that by when we engage in krishna consciousness we can immediately understand our spiritual identity our spiritual identity is that we are spirit souls part and parcel of krishna we are eternal servants of krishna so the more we hear and chant we will be able to understand this knowledge and then how do we understand krishna krishna himself says in bhagavad gita bhaktya mam abhijanati i can be understood only by devotion so what happens is the devotee he engages in hearing and chanting then he comes to the point of liberation because he's become krishna conscious he continues his hearing and chanting and then he can understand the position of he can understand the supreme lord hmm. so we can see how by krishna consciousness we can be real uh, situated in our real position our real identity you know we have our identity we have identity cards to prove our identity you know this is my name this is my country of birth like that so in the material world we have this identity card and that's identity of the body but whereas each of us have a spiritual identity and we can easily know our spiritual identity when we engage in devotional service more we hear and chant so anyway prabhupad here is giving a small uh the eight fold yoga system why it's called ashtanga because it's got eight limbs which begins by the am niyam the do's and the don'ts you know we think yoga is maybe just some stretches which we do in the gym but yoga means linking linking to the supreme so the ashtanga yoga the the physical exercise part is just one tiny part of the whole thing and yoga begins with the rules and regulations there are certain do's and don'ts and then a place a proper place has to be chosen krishna says in the 6th chapter we will hear he says you have to go to the forest you have to find a seat neither too high nor too low you know then the, the yogi does the breathing process why does he do breathing because he knows he needs a very long life to be able to achieve perfection by this process vishwamitra did uh, meditation for around 60000 years kardama muni 10000 years so you know a long life is needed but in kali we do not have that kind of life barely we live for even a hundred years and so that's the reason all the scriptures all the um yeah all the shastras they tell us for us in in kali yoga the best yoga is the sankirtan yoga sankirtan yoga engaging in hearing and chanting about the lord and we can easily 
revive our eternal loving relationship with Krishna. We can realize our spiritual identity. Any questions, comments? No, then we continue reading this verse. 529, Shila Prabhupada would call it as the peace formula. This is the peace formula. We are all looking for peace. And if we can understand this verse, we will become peaceful. Bhogdaram yagya tapasam. Bhogdaram yagya tapasam. Sarva loka maheshwaram. Sarva loka maheshwaram. Suridam sarva bhutanam. Suridam sarva Gyatva maam shanti mrachati. Gyatva maam shanti mrachati. Translation. A person in full consciousness of me, knowing me to be the ultimate beneficiary of all sacrifices and austerities, the supreme lord of all planets and demigods, and the benefactor and well-wisher of all living entities, attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. The conditioned souls within the clutches of the illusory energy are all anxious to attain peace in the material world, but they do not know the formula for peace, which is explained in this part of the Bhagavad Gita. The greatest peace formula is simply this. Lord Krishna is the beneficiary in all human activities. Men should offer everything to the transcendental service of the Lord because he is the proprietor of all planets and the demigods thereon. No one is greater than he. He is greater than the greatest of the demigods. Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma in the Vedas, Shweta Shwatra Upanishad, the Supreme Lord is described as Tam Ishwaram Pran Pramamam Pramam Maheshwaram. Under the spell of illusion, living entities are trying to be lords of all they survey, but actually they are dom dominated by the material energy of the Lord. The Lord is the master of material nature, and the conditioned souls are under the stringent rules of material nature. Unless one understands these bare facts, it is not possible to achieve peace in the world, either individually or collectively. This is the sense of Krishna consciousness. Lord Krishna is the supreme free dominator, and all living entities, including the great demigods, are his subordinates. One can attain perfect peace only in complete Krishna consciousness. The fifth chapter is a practical explanation of Krishna consciousness, generally known as Karma Yoga. The question of mental speculation as to how Karma Yoga can give liberation is answered herewith. To work in Krishna consciousness is to work with the complete knowledge of the Lord as the predominator. Such work is not different from transcendental knowledge. Direct Krishna consciousness is Bhakti Yoga and Jnana Yoga is the path leading to Bhakti Yoga. Krishna consciousness means to work in full knowledge of one's relationship with the Supreme Absolute and the perfection of this consciousness is full knowledge of Krishna or the Supreme Personality of Godhead. A pure soul is the eternal servant of God as his fragmental part and parcel. He comes into contact with Maya, illusion, due to the desire to lord it over Maya. And that is the cause of his many sufferings. As long as he is in contact with the matter, he has to execute work in terms of material necessities. Krishna consciousness, however, brings one into spiritual life even while one is within the jurisdiction of matter. For it is an arousing of spiritual existence by practice in the material world. The more one is advanced, the more he is freed from the clutches of matter. The Lord is not partial toward anyone. Everything depends on one's practical performance of duties in Krishna consciousness, which helps one control the senses in every respect and conquer the influence of desire and anger. And one who stands fast in Krishna consciousness, controlling the above mentioned passions, remains factually in the transcendental stage, or Brahma Nirvan. The eightfold yoga mysticism is automatically practiced in Krishna consciousness because the ultimate purpose is so. There is a gradual process of elevation in the practice of Yam Niyam, Asan, 
pranayam, pratehar, dharan, dhyan, and shmadhi. But these only preface perfection by devotional service, which alone can award peace to the human being. It is the highest perfection of life. Thus end the Bhakti Vedanta purports to the fifth chapter of Srimad Bhagavad Gita in the matter of Karma Yoga or action in Krishna consciousness. So here Krishna in this verse is telling us how we can become peaceful. Attains peace from the pangs of material miseries. They are the material miseries which are uh, we are being inflicted by this, by our own body and mind or by other living entities, or by material nature. At every moment, each of us is subjected to either one or more of these. We may realize it, we may not realize it. But that's what's happening. Now Krishna is saying, how can we get free? How can we become peaceful in this atmosphere? Saying by becoming Krishna conscious, by understanding Krishna's position, you know, we do some sacrifices. So, for whose pleasure is that sacrifice? It's meant for the pleasure of Krishna. Because he is the proprietor of everything. The planets. And who do the planets belong to? Belongs to Krishna. This, the, the, the air, the wind. Who does it belong to? Belongs to Krishna. So the demigods, who do the demigods belong to? The demigods also belong to Krishna. Each and every one of us is part and parcel of Krishna. Even the demigods are part and parcel of Krishna. So if we understand that everything belongs to Krishna and that everything should be engaged in Krishna's service, then we will become peaceful. If we can understand that Krishna is everyone's best friend. You know, we may think I am somebody's best friend. We may think that. But the real best friend is Krishna. He's everyone's best friend. And controller, we may think the sun and the moon are listening to us. The rains are listening to us. But who, whose order are they following actually? Under whose order is the sun rising and setting every day? The wind is blowing. Uh, death comes at the end of life. It's under the order of Krishna. So once we can understand that Krishna is the controller, Krishna is the proprietor, and Krishna is the best friend of every living entity, one can get peace. You know, even the even the great great demigods, Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, these are great personalities. But even they are parts and parcel of Krishna. They are not independent of Krishna. So the more we hear and chant, more we hear and chant. The more we understand Krishna's position, the more we understand our position, the more peaceful we can become. Because we, we, right now, under this influence of material nature, we are thinking we are the body. We are thinking we are separate of Krishna. We are independent of Krishna. But that is just a, a illusion. It's the work of illusion. But the more we hear and chant about Krishna, the more we can be situated in our real position, real identity. So Prabhupada is explaining to us that this fifth chapter, Karma Yoga, Karma Yoga is practically, because each of us have duties to perform. Each of us have certain responsibilities to do. So how by doing the duties, we can get liberation by understanding that Krishna is the controller, he's the proprietor, he's the best friend. So then offering the result of our activity to Krishna working for Krishna's satisfaction, working in such a way that Krishna will be satisfied. That is Karma Yoga. This is what Krishna is telling Arjuna to do. Do your duty for my satisfaction. Don't get attached to the result. We get attached to the result of our 
activities. And then because of that, we get bound by the laws of karma and we continue to live in this material world. So whether we are past, we are taking the path of Gyan Yoga or Ashtanga Yoga, we have to come to the point of Bhakti Yoga to be able to get give us the uh, success of the path of Gyan or Ashtanga. Whatever processes we follow, we have to come to the point of Bhakti Yoga to get the uh, real success, to understand our relationship with Krishna, to understand ourself, who am I, who's God, what's my relationship with him. So who am I? A, a pure soul, every living entity is a pure soul, is a part and parcel of Krishna, fragmental part and parcel. We are, min we are minute. The, the Vedas explain to us our size is one ten thousand, the tip of the hair. So it's minute. It's a size. It's not that it's not. Even if Prabhupada would say if you put a black dot, it's still a size. You know? And if we look under the microscope, we will be able to measure the length and the breadth. So we, that's our size. Even though it's tiny, we have a size. But now, because we are in this material atmosphere, we are thinking that I'm independent of Krishna. We have forgotten our relationship with Krishna. So the more we engage in devotional service, the more we can be situated in our real position. And once we understand our real position, that's liberation. Then the material energy, she has no uh, influence over the pure devotee. And the pure devotee, that stage is called Brahma Nirvana. It's a transcendental stage. It's liberated. The pure devotee has completely understood his position as spirit, soul, part and parcel of Krishna. So he's working in that consciousness. He's understood, I'm not the body. So he's not working in the consciousness. Oh, if I do this, I'll get this. If I do this, I'll get this. No. He's working, understanding, I am part and parcel of Krishna. I'm Krishna's servant. How can I please Krishna? I'm going to do this so Krishna will be pleased. Let me follow Krishna's instructions for Krishna's pleasure. This is how he's thinking. And he's so he's liberated. Because he's acting on the platform of the soul. Hmm. So just as in Ashtanga Yoga, there's Yam, Niyam, there are the do's and don'ts. Similarly, in Krishna consciousness movement also, there are do's and don'ts. Doing everything that's favorable for Krishna consciousness. Not, don't, not doing anything that's unfavorable for Krishna consciousness. Doing, doing is what? Hearing and chanting. Not doing is what engaging in the not engaging in the prohibited activities, you know. Then asan, asan is the, you know getting a nice place to do the chanting. Pranayam automatically when we are chanting, the breathing process is involved. So like this, we can see dhyan samadhi, complete absorption in chanting the holy name. So this is also there in bhakti. And in, in fact, by, by becoming a devotee, we, we are, that's the, that's the natural position of every living entity, Krishna consciousness. Everyone is naturally a devotee of Krishna. We have simply forgotten it and we need to revive it. And so that's why it's called the highest perfection of life. Because it can be done only in this human form of life. Any questions? Yeah. 
Dharma Yoga, it's not that Krishna is saying don't do anything. He's saying do your activities, whatever duties we may have, but for the pleasure of Krishna, offering the result of this duties to Krishna. So we don't get the reactions for those. Moving on to chapter 6, Dhyan Yoga. Shri Bhagwan Uvacha. Shri Bhagwan Uvacha. Anashrita Karma Falam. Anashrita Karma Falam. Karyam Karma Karotiya. Karyam Karma Karotiya. Sa Sanyasi Cha Yogi Cha. Sa Sanyasi Cha Yogi Cha. Na Niragnir Na Chakriya. Na Niragnir Niragnir Na Chakriya. Can someone please read? Okay, I can read. Yeah. The Supreme Personality of Godhead said, One who is unattached to the fruits of his work and who works as he is obligated is in the renounced order of life, and he is a true mystic. Not he who lights no fire and performs no duty. In this chapter, the Lord explains the process of the eightfold yoga system is a means to control the mind and the senses. However, this is very difficult for people in general to perform, especially in the age of Kali. Although the eightfold yoga system is recommended in this chapter, the Lord emphasizes that the process of karma yoga or acting in Krishna consciousness is better. Everyone acts in this world to maintain his family and their paraphernalia. But no one is working without some interest, uh, some personal gratification, but be it con some self-interest, some personal gratification, be it concentrated or extended. The criterion of perfection is to act in Krishna consciousness and not with a view to enjoying the fruits of work. To act in Krishna consciousness is the duty of every living entity because all are constitutionally parts and parcels of the Supreme. The parts of the body work for the satisfaction of the whole body. The limbs of the body do not act for self-satisfaction, but for the satisfaction of the complete whole. Similarly, the living entity who acts for satisfaction of the supreme whole and not for personal satisfaction is the perfect sannyasi, the perfect yogi. The sannyasis sometimes artificially think that liberated from all material duties and therefore they cease to perform Agni Hotra Yajnas, fire sacrifices, but actually they are self-interested because their goal is to become one with the impersonal Brahman. Such a desire is greater than any material desire, but it is not without self-interest. Similarly, the mystic yogi who practices the yoga system with half open eyes, seizing all material activities, desire some satisfaction for his personal sense. But a person acting in Krishna consciousness works for the satisfaction of the whole without self-interest. A Krishna conscious person has no desire for self-satisfaction. His criterion of success is the satisfaction of Krishna. And thus he is the perfect sannyasi or perfect yogi. Lord Chaitanya, the highest perfectional symbol of renunciation, prays in this way. Na dhanam, na janam, na sundarim. Kavitam va jagat visa kamaye, Mama janmami janma nashvere, Bhavata bhaktir ahituku tave. O Almighty Lord, I have no desire to accumulate wealth, nor to enjoy beautiful women, nor do I want any number of followers. 
what i want only is a causeless mercy of your devotional service in my life birth after birth so here krishna is saying one who works who works krishna is not saying don't work work that's what he's telling Arjuna. Arjuna was in fact saying, I'll go retire to the forest. I'll become a renunciator. But Krishna is saying, no, you do your duty, whatever. Arjuna, your duty is to fight, you fight. But don't get attached to the result. Don't think whether I'll lose the war, I'll not lose. What's going to happen? No. That, you leave it to me. You work because it's your duty to work. And work for my satisfaction. And by doing that, you're actually in the renounced order. It means you're not going to get any karma for it. You know, we may artificially say, oh, well, I'm not going to do any work because I'm going to get karma. So I'm going to renounce the world. But merely changing our dress does not mean anything. The real, the real, uh, because what can we renounce after all? We don't have anything that we can renounce it. Everything belongs to Krishna. So when we can work in that consciousness, understanding that anyways, everything works uh, uh, belongs to Krishna. So let me work for his satisfaction. That is real renunciation. So Karma Yoga Krishna is the entire premise of Bhagavad Gita is to bring us to this point. Because we are very attached to the results. We say, why? Why should I work then if Krishna is saying, don't enjoy the result? Why should I put so much endeavor? Why should I bring so much endeavor to do my duty? And he's saying, don't even enjoy the result of the duty. Do it for his satisfaction. Why should I even do it? But because our nature will make us act. We may say, I'm not going to work. But the modes of nature will make us act. We cannot sit without any activity. The soul is always active. And right now we are under the modes of nature. So we are wanting to gain some. Gain some and, and Krishna is saying, no, he's, he's not saying don't take anything. But uh, Sri Sopanishad says, take whatever is your quota. We do have needs. We are in the material body. We do have needs, of course. So whatever is our quota, we take that. But understanding well to whom everything belongs, that everything belongs to Krishna. Thank you, Shla Prabhupada is saying, why is Shla Prabhupada saying uh, to act in Krishna consciousness is the duty of every living entity? Why? He's saying here to act in Krishna because consciousness. We all are parts and parcels of the Supreme. Yes. Yes. That is our real identity. We have forgotten it. We have forgotten. But this is the fact that we are parts and parcels of Supreme. Right now, we are thinking our identity is with whatever. You know, our passport says or our identity card says. But this is our real position. And so that's the reason Krishna is saying you work, but you offer the result to me. And in that way, it's not that we won't enjoy. In fact, we will enjoy more. We will be peaceful. So we will be able to be happy. Otherwise, the mind makes us go crazy, you know, with our, what the result is going to be. Because we get attached to the result. But if we can just offer the result to Krishna, work for the satisfaction of Krishna, we automatically will become peaceful. And when we are peaceful, we can be happy. So Prabhupada is explaining, you know, the hands and the legs. It's not that the hand is saying, I'm going to cook the food and I'm going to eat the food myself. So putting the food inside the hand or applying it as a paste. Or the legs are saying, oh, I went to buy the food, so I'm going to put the food on my, massage the food with, on myself. No. The whole body is working 
to put the food in the mouth. And the mouth is also working, why? To food to put go in the stomach. And like this, the whole body is nourished. Similarly, when we work to satisfy Krishna, in fact, we will be able to please everyone, just like watering the root of the tree. Prabhupada gives that example. Pour the water on the root of the tree, the entire tree becomes healthy and happy. So we are trying to make so many different individuals happy by our work. But if we can make Krishna happy by our work, then automatically we will be able to please everyone. So then how can we be situated in this consciousness? We need to hear. We need to hear more, chant more. The more we hear, the more we chant, the more Krishna consciousness, Krishna conscious we will become. Yeah, Prabhupada is saying that even the Gyan Yogi or Ashtanga Yogi, there is a, as a desire, a material desire is still there. A desire may be to merge into the Brahman, or the desire may be to, uh, the, to get this eight siddhis, the Ash, the mystic yogis, they aspire to get the eight siddhis. The jnani may aspire to merge in the impersonal Brahman. So the self-interest is there. But the devotee, devotee is working for what? Please Krishna. That's the pure devotee. His, his only consciousness I want to please Krishna. I want to work for Krishna's pleasure. And Lord Chaitanya is teaching us in this prayers, which is called the Shikshash to come. So, one of the verses, one of the prayers is um, this is how the pure devotee prays. This is the consciousness of the pure devotee. What is he desiring? He's not desiring wealth, beautiful women, or followers. But what does he want? He says, please give me your causeless mercy. Please engage me in your pure devotional service, birth after birth. But one will say, but oh, but I, I want to go back home, back to Godhead. Why should I be here in the material world? There's no difference. Pure devotional service is the liberated platform. One is already with Krishna. In the, con the consciousness is already in the spiritual world. So even though he may be in the material world, his consciousness is with Krishna. So he's always liberated. This is how a pure devotee prays. He's not desiring that, give me so much fame, give me so much wealth, give me so many beautiful women I want to enjoy with them. He's saying, kindly just give me a pure devotional service. Why? Because he's experiencing so much happiness. So much enjoyment he's experiencing by engaging in pure devotional service that he does not want it to stop. You see, we souls, we are all pleasure-seeking. We are never going to do something which does not give us happiness or enjoyment. We are always doing things that uh, will give us enjoyment. So here the pure devotee, he's showing us that he, there is greatest enjoyment in devotional service. Higher enjoyment than get, becoming wealthy or enjoying with beautiful women or by even getting famous. So he's teaching us in that way. And we also somehow should be able to have this desire. Oh, it will be so nice if even I can become a pure devotee. It will be so nice if I can also engage in pure devotional service. Mm -hmm. Somehow or the other, we can arouse this desire. Is that okay? Yam sanyasam iti prapa. Yam sanyasam iti prapa. Yogam tam vidhi pandava. Yogam tam vidhi pandava. Nahi asanyasta sankalpo. Nahi asanyasta sankalpo. 
योगी भवति कश्चन योगी भवति कश्चन Translation: What is called renunciation, you should know to be the same as yoga, or linking oneself with the supreme. O son of Pandu, for one can never become a yogi unless he renounces 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 the desire for sense gratification. Real sannyas yoga or bhakti means that one should know his constitutional position as a living entity and act accordingly. The living entity has no separate, independent identity. He is the marginal energy of the supreme. When he is entrapped by material energy, he is conditioned. And when he is Krishna conscious or aware of the spiritual energy, then he is in his real and natural state of life. Therefore, when one is in complete knowledge, one ceases all material sense gratification or renounces all kinds of sense gratificatory activities. This is practiced by the yogis who restrain from who restrain the senses from material attachment. But a person in Krishna consciousness has no opportunity to engage in senses. He senses in anything which is not. For the purpose of Krishna, therefore, a Krishna conscious person is simultaneously a sannyasi and a yogi. The purpose of knowledge and of restraining the senses, as as prescribed in the Gyan and Yoga processes, is automatically served in Krishna consciousness. If one is unable to give up the activities of his selfish nature, then Gyan and Yoga are of no avail. The real aim is for a living entity to give up all selfish satisfaction and to be prepared to satisfy the Supreme. A Krishna conscious person has no desire for any kinds of self enjoyment. He is always engaged for the enjoyment of the Supreme. One who has no information of the Supreme must therefore be engaged in self-satisfaction because no one can stand on the platform of inactivity. All purposes are perfectly served by the practice of Krishna consciousness. So Krishna is saying, what is yoga? Linking oneself with the Supreme. And what does a yogi do? He practices sense control. A yogi or a jnani, what, what is the, the goal is to control the senses after all. And the control of the senses is automatically done in bhakti yoga by the devotee. Why? Because he's engaging all his senses in service of Krishna. So he, he does not need to externally control the senses. Eyes wants to see, so he sees the deity, he, see, he reads the books, he uh, sees the devotees, he wants to speak something, he speaks about Krishna, he wants to eat something, he eats Krishna Prashant. So automatically the senses are controlled without extraneous endeavor. And because uh, he has He's understood his position in relation to Krishna. He's liberated. He's understood, I'm not this body. I don't have a separate independent identity. I am eternal part and parcel of Krishna. You know, that is the real position. And he becomes independent in that. We are thinking we are independent right now. But we don't realize that how we are bound by the modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. These are tight ropes that are bound us. We are thinking we are independent. But we don't realize that actually it's these modes have bound us and they make us act. But the real independence is when we can understand our true identity as parts and parcels of Krishna. So the more we hear and chant, the more we hear from Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, chant the holy name, the more we will be able to realize this knowledge. The more we will be able to experience Krishna, the more Krishna conscious we will become. 
act we have to act here the the act the soul is going to be act the, we can never be inactive something or the other we are going to do but what do we choose how do we choose to act we are going to choose to act to satisfy our own senses or we choose to act to satisfy Krishna's senses. If one does not know that one has to act to satisfy Krishna's senses, then of course one will act to satisfy own senses because we, we have to act, cannot not act. So we need to choose to act for Krishna's senses. That is spiritual life. That's under the shelter of spiritual energy. The pure devotee is always engaged in uh, satisfying Krishna. So it's not that he's giving up work to satisfy Krishna. No, he's doing his work to satisfy Krishna. Understanding that Krishna is the one, Krishna himself says, I create this four divisions of human society, four varnas and four ashram. And each of us have some position in society. We have some duty, obligations. So we do those obligations for Krishna's satisfaction. Hmm? Working for the pleasure of Krishna, that's karma yoga. Working to please Krishna. Hearing and chanting is also done for the pleasure of Krishna. Hearing and chanting for Krishna's pleasure. Akro. Aru Rukshor Muner Yogam. Aruksor Muner Yogam. Karma Karanam Uchete. Karma Karanam Uchete. Yoga Rudhasya Tasyeva. Yoga Rudhasya Tasyeva. Shama Karanam Uchete. Shama Karanam Uchete. Translation, for one who is a neophyte in the Eightfold Yoga system, work is said to be the means and for one who is already elevated in yoga, cessation of all material activities is said to be the means. The process of linking oneself with the Supreme is called yoga. It may be compared to a ladder for attaining the topmost spiritual realization. This ladder begins from the lowest material condition of the living entity and rises up to perfect self-realization in pure spiritual life. According to various elevations, different parts of the ladder are known by different names. But all in all, the complete ladder is called yoga and may be divided into three parts, namely Jnana Yoga, Dhyan Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. The beginning of the ladder is called the Yogaru Rukshu stage and the highest rung is called Yoga Ruddha. Con concerning the eightfold yoga system, attempts in the beginning to enter into meditation through regulative principles of life and practice of different sitting postures, which are more or less bodily exercises, are considered fruitive material activities. Mm -hmm. All such activities lead to achieving perfect mental equilibrium to control the senses. When one is accomplished in the practice of meditation, he ceases all disturbing mental activities. A Krishna conscious person, however, is situated from the beginning on the platform of meditation because he's always thinking of Krishna. And being constantly engaged in the service of Krishna, he's considered to have ceased all material activities. So Krishna is speaking about the yoga ladder. Yoga ladder, Krishna spoke also about Karmkand in the third chapter, you know, doing some sacrifices to, to please the demigods, to get, uh, to go up to the heavenly planets or to enjoy nicely in this world. 
But the idea is not to get stuck there. The idea is by doing that, we'll come in contact with the devotees who are helping us do the sacrifices, who will tell us, you know, why you're doing this? It's temporary after all. Even if you go to the heavenly planets, it's a temporary position. Rather, you work in devotion. Rather, you take a bhakti. And then one, uh, uh, or one may come to the point of understanding that, oh, you're doing all this, but it's all material. But we are spirit souls. So then one may from that point come to the point of jnana, understanding, oh, I'm not the body, I'm spirit. Uh -huh. So then there's an elevation in the consciousness. And then from there, one may rise further in consciousness, trying to understand, okay, I'm the spirit. Then, but who is the Supreme Spirit? And so one, there's a gradual elevation as the, as the ladder, you know, it's got in the rungs, one, two, higher and higher, we can go. So by this process, one can go higher, higher, or one may take immediately to Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is the highest rung on the ladder and everything, all the, all what are we to gain from the lo from the other yoga processes are included in bhakti yoga. You know, knowledge is included. Uh, then one may say, what about samadhi? Samadhi is included. Bhakti yoga, the devotee fixes his mind on Krishna and engages in devotional service. So what is the end of uh, Ashtanga yoga huh? is in fact the beginning of bhakti yoga because the devotee fixes his mind on Krishna and engages in all sorts of activities. So we can see that by engaging in bhakti yoga, we can get the benefit of all other yoga and much more. We can be situated in our real constitutional position. Real constitutional position. Constantly engaged in the service of Krishna. So one may say, oh, and because he's constantly engaged in Krishna's position, uh, service, automatically he's not doing any material activity. All his activities are on the spiritual platform, liberated platform. So automatically his senses and mind are completely controlled. Hmm. So the other processes of yoga, they strive very hard to control the mind and senses, but the, the pure devotee, because he fixes his mind on Krishna, his mind and senses are automatically controlled. So we need to hear, hear more. And we, the more we hear, the more we chant, the more our senses and mind can be controlled, the more we can fix our mind on Krishna. Are there any questions or comments? No, then let's stop yeah, here. Uh, uh, hmm? I want to know what, what are the things included in devotional service? Uh, you mean, so the first, for example, nectar of devotion says the first first symptom is that we get free from all the material miseries. That's, that's liberation. Yeah. Immediate liberation. Okay. And then... Uh, no, I mean, uh, what should we do if we are doing devotional service? If we want uh, to engage in devotional service? Engaging. Yeah, the so, devotional service begins with hearing, chanting. Then mm -hmm. we go on Remembering, there are nine processes. Hearing, chanting, remembering. Then we have uh, offering prayers. Mm -hmm. uh, deity worship, engaging in deity worship. Then we have serving the lotus feet of the Lord. Serving as a friend. And complete surrender. Complete self-surrender to the Lord. These are the eight 
processes of devotional service. And to us at our level, hearing and chanting are very, very um, appropriate or very helpful. Okay. The, if we have heard properly, we'll be able to chant. If we have heard and chanted properly, we will be able to remember Krishna. And then, of mm -hmm. course, remember uh, offering prayers, deity worship, you know. Okay. So, yeah. uh, as you said, like in other yoga, it's uh, discussed today, we discussed like Astang Yoga. Mm -hmm. uh, even a yogi desires some siddhis right mm -hmm. and even when we uh, in devotional service when we offer let's say we offer prasad to lord first then mm -hmm. also don't we desire that lord first eats and only then we will eat isn't it also a kind of desire when we yeah. are too much engaged in devotional service then a stage comes that we want to see uh, Krishna or we want to talk to Krishna something like that isn't it also a desire but then that's a spiritual desire because that's our real and constitutional position it's a good desire to please Krishna okay okay so we, it's, we should have more and more of those desires to satisfy Krishna, to please Krishna. I see. Because that's the position of the soul. And even like uh, uh, to achieve liberation, uh, achieving liberation, is that a desire or no? Yes, it's a desire. It's a desire, okay. Yes. So we may desire liberation, but yet continue to worship Krishna. Bhagavatam says, Akama Sarva Kama Va Moksha Kama Dhamiti. That we may desire liberation, we or we may desire all sorts of material desires, or we may have no desires, material desires at all. Whatever is a whatever is our position, just engage in devotional service to Krishna. Because okay. Krishna will fulfill our desires in such a way and will give us all perfection. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So because, you know, at our position, we have so many material desires. What do we do? Where are we supposed to go? We still continue to hear and chant. Worship Krishna. Or we may desire liberation. What do we do? Continue to worship Krishna. Continue to hear and chant. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.